Chris. Chris. Chris Ferguson. Jesus. Jesus Ferguson. The man they call Jesus. Chris Ferguson is seeking his astounding sixth bracelet. Chris Ferguson looked like no one else at the table. With his signature black cowboy hat, his long hair, he was the definition of the poker boom. And he enjoyed a meteoric rise in the poker world, becoming one of the most renowned and respected players in the game. However, his legacy is marred by a shocking revelation that has completely tarnished his image. His involvement in a massive Ponzi scheme. We're going to look at the life and career of Chris Ferguson, exploring his humble beginnings, his ascent to poker superstardom, and the subsequent downfall that shattered his once sterling reputation. Through Ferguson's story, we reflect on the importance of staying grounded and being a good person, even in the face of overwhelming success. But before we get into it all, I just wanted to say thanks for being here. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do. Hit that bell to make sure you're notified of all future releases. All right, here we go. Chris Ferguson was born on April 11th, 1963 in Los Angeles, California. Raised in a supportive and academic environment, he grew up with a deep interest in math and game theory. His father, Thomas Ferguson, was a renowned mathematics professor at UCLA, who later went on to write books on probability theory. It was in this intellectually stimulating atmosphere that Chris developed a fascination with strategic thinking and decision making and started playing poker at the age of just 10 years old. Ferguson would later go on to attend UCLA himself. I got my undergraduate degree at uh, UCLA in uh, math computer science. And then I went on into the computer science program at uh, UCLA. And... His initial foray into the world of poker began during this time. He found solace in the competitive nature of poker and started frequenting local poker rooms. Recognizing the intellectual challenges and potential financial gains, he decided to leave academia and devote himself to the game full time. Chris Jesus Ferguson. His legendary math skills had to give away to his instincts there. His math was good, his instincts were pristine. Ferguson's ascent in the poker world was nothing short of remarkable. With his long hair, his signature cowboy hat, and his enigmatic demeanor, he captured the imagination of poker enthusiasts worldwide. He honed his skills, playing cash games and tournaments, mastering the art of reading opponents, and applying game theory concepts. In the 2000 WSOP, Ferguson won his first bracelet in the $2,500 seven card stud event for $151,000. His breakthrough then truly came when he followed that up by defeating TJ Cloutier, heads up at the main event, to win the $1.5 million prize. This triumph propelled him into the limelight and cemented his status as one of the game's elite. Over the next few years, he consistently delivered outstanding performances, winning six WSOP events in total. In 2004, he earned $120,000 in the main event for his 26th place finish out of 2,576 players. He finished runner-up to Phil Helmuth in the 2005 National Heads Up Poker Championship. There would be no grief on the river this yes. time for Phil oh. Helmuth. His grief hold up, and he wins the National Heads Up Poker Championship. He made the finals again in 2006, but again finished second, this time to Ted Forrest. The uh, King of Hearts, Ted Forrest, is the National Heads Up Poker Champion. In 2008, he made the finals for the third time, this time defeating Andy Block and winning the title. It's a seven of clubs, and Chris Ferguson, he had to look at it for a while. Chris Ferguson is the 2008 Heads Up Champ. At the 2017 WSOP, Ferguson, or Jesus as many began to call him, due to his appearance, set a record with 23 caches. He also won his sixth bracelet and first in 14 years at the WSOP Europe, which would win him the WSOP Player of the Year Award. The most embarrassing thing that's happened to me at the poker table is, is losing. However, despite his fame and success, Ferguson's legacy took an irreversible hit in the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis. It was discovered that he was a key figure in the infamous Full Tilt Poker scandal where players' funds were mismanaged and misappropriated, with many calling the entire situation a Ponzi scheme. Ferguson was one of the co-founders of the massive online poker site, and he, along with fellow poker superstar Howard Lederer and Ray First, were the subject of a civil complaint brought on by the U.S. Department of Justice. 
The once adored poker icon was accused of defrauding players out of millions of dollars. Internet gambling is crack cocaine for gamblers. You just click the mouse and lose your house. Ferguson, for his part, remained silent throughout the controversy, offering no apology, no explanation for his actions. And this lack of remorse further tarnished his image and damaged the trust he had built within the poker community. A lawyer for Ferguson denied the allegations, suggesting that the issues may have been the result of mismanagement, not malice, and the case was eventually dismissed in February of 2013. At the end of the day, the story of Chris Ferguson serves as a cautionary tale, reminding us of the importance of remaining grounded and true to our values, regardless of our achievements. Despite reaching the pinnacle of success in the poker world, Ferguson's fall from grace highlights the consequences of losing sight of ethical behavior. It is crucial that true greatness is not solely defined by material wealth or professional accomplishments. Success should be coupled with integrity, with compassion, and a commitment to doing the right thing. Chris Ferguson's controversial legacy serves as a reminder that even those who achieve great heights can stumble and make regrettable choices. Through his story, we learn that fame and fortune do not exempt individuals from the responsibility of being decent human beings. While his downfall has cast a shadow over his once glowing reputation, it's important to remember that people are multifaceted. It is possible to acknowledge his poker skills, which frankly are undeniable, and contributions to the game while also condemning his unethical behavior. The complexity of human nature teaches us that individuals are capable of both admirable achievements and grave mistakes. Also, Ferguson's case emphasizes the significance of holding individuals accountable for their actions regardless of their status or their accomplishments. It is crucial for the poker community, as well as society at large, to demand transparency, integrity, and fair play from its members. The controversial legacy of Chris Ferguson stands as a cautionary tale about the perils of losing one's moral compass in the pursuit of success, while his rise to poker stardom showcased his exceptional skills and his strategic prowess. His involvement in the Full Tilt scandal subsequently shattered his reputation and betrayed the trust of many. Being on top of the world does not absolve us from our responsibility to be ethical and genuine individuals. But hey, let's be real. If you really feel the need to dupe others and take their money in a legitimate way, there's no better place to do it than at the poker table. We've covered some of the most hated players in poker. I deeply regret not being able to prevent Black Friday from happening. Are you in any way associated with the ultimatebet.net super user cheating scandal? What was your problem, please? My problem is that you're not following the rules. But many would say that this is the most controversial figure to emerge out of the poker boom. The thing that saddens me is, is once again, you know, you know, the hero of the story was also cheating. The heroes of poker don't cheat. Howard Lederer, or the professor as he was coined, was once on top of the world. So how did he end up at rock bottom? In the high stakes world of professional poker, there are few names as iconic and controversial as Howard Lederer. For decades, he stood at the pinnacle of the poker hierarchy, hailed as one of the game's brightest stars. But like many stories in the realm of gambling and fame, Lederer's narrative is a complex one marked by dizzying highs and devastating lows. Howard Lederer was born on October 30th, 1964 in Concord, New Hampshire. Far from the glitz and glamour of Las Vegas or the high stakes poker rooms of the world. Raised in a family of card enthusiasts, including his sister, professional poker player Annie Duke. Did, did, did you catch me beating my brother a pot? <laughs> Lederer's early exposure to games like chess and backgammon laid the foundation for his later success in poker. It was actually through chess that he would discover poker. During his college years at Columbia University, he would frequent local chess clubs to hone his game. One of these clubs featured a back room dedicated to poker, and Lederer quickly became enamored with the strategic complexities of the game. His innate talent for mathematics and psychology made him a formidable opponent. Lederer's journey from a college student learning the ropes to becoming a poker icon was nothing short of remarkable. He honed his skills in underground New York City poker clubs, often playing against seasoned pros twice his age. His unassuming demeanor and mathematical genius earned him the nickname The Professor. I certainly felt that at some point in my poker career I'd get to the final table, but uh, certainly in my first effort, this is the first time I've entered the big, the, uh, the big tournament, uh, I didn't expect to get this far. As he gained experience, Lederer began to compete in prestigious poker tournaments, consistently performing well. 
and by the late 1990s and early 2000s, he was a household name in the poker world, known for his analytical approach and his unshakable composure at the tables. His success culminated in two World Series of Poker bracelets and numerous other accolades, making him one of the biggest poker stars on the planet. I am trying as hard as I can try. I am thinking as hard as I can think at the table. You may not see that, but it's there. Starting in 2002, he embarked on a remarkable journey of wins, including the 2002 World Poker Finals and the 2003 Party Poker Million. This thing is over! Howard Letter turns up two pair and wins this pot. He has become a two-time World Poker Tour champion, Vince. The Letterer's most significant single cash windfall occurred in 2008, an unforgettable year when he emerged victorious in the fiercely competitive $100,000 Aussie Millions Poker Championship. This monumental victory yielded him a colossal prize of nearly $1.1 million, cementing his status as a poker luminary on both the domestic and international stages. However, Letterer's seemingly unstoppable rise came to a dramatic halt in the wake of the Full Tilt poker scandal. Hard to let this go, but when you're beat, you're beat. One of the darkest chapters in the history of online poker. Full Tilt Poker, co-founded by Letterer, Chris Ferguson, and others, was once one of the largest online poker platforms globally. However, the zenith of Full Tilt's success gave way to a sudden and profound end on April 15, 2011 a fateful day infamously tagged as Black Friday. On April 15th, I was playing poker like any other day, and all of a sudden we just couldn't play anymore. Money was frozen. The US Department of Justice, in a sweeping move, barred access to several major online poker sites catering to American players, Full Tilt and poker stars among them. It was like the end of the world and poker, it just everything stopped right there, it was, it was over. Poker stars demonstrating remarkable resilience swiftly rebounded, returning to business as usual for players worldwide. But in stark contrast, Full Tilt unraveled as investigations unveiled a disconcerting truth. They've also, by the way, added two big poker stars' names, Chris Ferguson and Howard Lederer, to the civil uh, case here, but it's, it's unbelievable. Howard Lederer, alongside his associates, was alleged to have orchestrated a global-scale Ponzi scheme utilizing player deposits to service shareholders and cover mounting expenses. The poker community's collective gaze turned towards Letterer, once one of their own, who they felt had betrayed their trust. Well, it's people like Howard Letterer and Ray Batar who's being named, the arrogant idiots who totally screwed the players here and deserve all the venom they're getting, plus about a thousand times worse. In 2012, Rational Group, the parent company of poker stars, reached an agreement to acquire Full Tilt as part of its settlement with the Department of Justice. This agreement also guaranteed that all players' balances were made whole. Poker stars agreed to give up $547 million to the federal government to pay all of the non-US Full Tilt players. Howard Letterer, in a personal settlement with the Department of Justice, forfeited in excess of $2.5 million dollars, although he steadfastly denied any wrongdoing. The poker community met this news with palpable dissatisfaction, viewing Lederer as a central figure in the debacle and yearning for a sense of justice. The professor, a moniker once synonymous with poker excellence, found himself unwelcome in the poker circuit. His disappearance from the public eye was conspicuous, with his last recorded live tournament appearance occurring in early 2011. It wasn't until May 20th, 2016 that Howard Lederer broke his silence, issuing a statement of contrition addressed to the entire poker community. In this reflection, he acknowledged his role and assumed responsibility for the tragic demise of Full Tilt, marking a moment in the saga of a fallen poker icon. In his apology, he wrote, I take full responsibility for Full Tilt's failure to protect player deposits leading up to Black Friday. The shortfall in player deposits should never have happened. I should have provided better oversight or made sure that responsible others provided that oversight. Many poker players have seen this apology and do not believe there's authenticity behind it. We cover the scandal in detail in our other videos surrounding Chris Ferguson. Make sure to check out that video. The link is in the description. As of 2022, Howard Lederer's total live tournament winnings exceeded $6.5 million, with his last cash being in January 2011. His 44 caches at the WSOP account for $1.5 million of those winnings. This story of Howard Lederer is a compelling narrative of triumph and of tragedy, filled with valuable lessons. First, it underscores the importance of accountability and ethics in the world of poker. No matter how successful one becomes, integrity and transparency should never be compromised. 
Letters fall serves as a stark reminder that even the most respected figures can face devastating consequences when trust is betrayed. You need to protect your reputation and you need to make sure that people at least still respect your game. His journey also highlights the need for responsible gambling and financial management. The allure of success in poker can be intoxicating, but it should never overshadow responsible bankroll management and ethical decision making. At the end of the day, Howard Lederer's life in the world of poker is a captivating tale of a rise and of a fall. His story is a source of lessons that remind us that the choices we make, both at and away from the poker table, can shape our destinies and leave a lasting legacy for better or for worse. I took and I take full responsibility for what happened. And what happened wasn't right, and it caused a lot of pain. This, 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 this. It's epic, 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 epic poker. The Epic Poker League, the XFL of the poker world. The XFL is going to be the extra fun league. And something we don't talk about nearly enough until now. In the world of professional poker, the Epic Poker League, or the EPL, emerged as a promising venture that aimed to revolutionize the industry. This league was also created to give the best players in the world a platform to continually match skills against each other. Founded in 2011 by Jeffrey Pollack, a former commissioner of the World Series of Poker, the league was envisioned as a player-centric organization that sought to bring integrity, transparency, and excitement to the game. You'd be disappointed if you folded. For old times sake. However, despite initial optimism and a star-studded roster of players, the Epic Poker League experienced a rapid rise and an even quicker fall, ultimately culminating in bankruptcy. So let's explore the factors that led to its creation, the involvement of prominent poker player Annie Duke. I want to wish everybody good luck. Shuffle up and deal. The highs experienced by the league, the reasons for its downfall, and the important lessons that can be drawn from the entire debacle. So the creation of the Epic Poker League was a response to perceived shortcomings in the poker industry. Pollock, driven by a desire to enhance the player experience, sought to establish a league that would prioritize fairness and professionalism. The EPL aimed to implement strict codes of conduct, drug testing, and standardized contracts for players. Additionally, Pollock envisioned a league that would introduce innovative television programming. In the back of my mind, I feel like people have more of an eye on me just to see what's going to happen. But I'm just going in with the mindset of just giving it my all and doing my best. Creating an immersive and engaging experience for viewers. With these goals in mind, the EPL was launched with great fanfare, generating substantial excitement among both players and fans. Annie Duke, a highly respected and accomplished professional poker player, played a crucial role in the Epic Poker League's development. Annie Duke was born on September 13, 1965, in Concord, New Hampshire. She began her journey towards poker stardom at an early age. Duke's passion for card games began during her childhood, where she regularly engaged in games with her family. Her competitive spirit and strategic thinking quickly became evident, setting the stage for her future success in the poker world. Annie Duke has defeated nine of the strongest poker players in the world and wins the first ever World Series of Poker Tournament of Champions. After completing her degree in English and Psychology at Columbia University, Duke decided to pursue a career in the game that had captivated her since childhood. She honed her skills by participating in underground poker games in Billings, Montana. Howard sent her her first stake of $2,400, gave her a few lessons over the phone. She won $2,800 her first month, and now she's here. In 1994, Duke made her debut with the World Series of Poker and quickly established herself as a formidable force. Her exceptional skills in reading opponents, making calculated decisions, and managing risk led to numerous victories and deep runs in various high-profile tournaments. One of Duke's most notable achievements came in 2004, when she won her first WSOP bracelet in the $2,000 Omaha High-Low Split event, earning her a coveted title and solidifying her place among the poker elite. I had had so many heartbreaks at the World Series where I had lost tournaments, so it was so great to get that monkey off my back and finally be like, yeah, you know what, I deserve to be a World Series champion. Throughout her career, she demonstrated remarkable consistency, consistently cashing in major tournaments and earning the respect of her peers. Annie Duke's impact on the poker world extends beyond her playing career as well. She's authored several books, including Thinking in Bets, Making Smarter Decisions When You Don't Have All the Facts, which explores decision-making strategies through the lens of poker. So if you look at the behavior of people at, po at the poker table, you can actually learn a lot about human decision-making. Her work has inspired countless individuals, both within 
and outside the poker community to apply critical thinking and logical reasoning to their daily lives. Duke was not only a prominent member of the league, but also served as the commissioner. And the co-founder of the Epic Poker League, uh, and by the name and the players that you have, it seems like Epic is very, very fitting. Thank you. <laughs> Her involvement led credibility and prestige to the EPL, and she was widely regarded as one of the most skilled and knowledgeable individuals in the poker community. Duke's extensive experience and reputation as a poker player added weight to the league's commitment to excellence and to player satisfaction. During its short existence, the Epic Poker League experienced several highs that momentarily fulfilled its promise. The league attracted a stellar lineup of talented players, including legends like Phil Helmuth, Eric Seidel, and Jason Mercier. The events organized by the EPL offered sizable prize pools and provided an enticing platform for players to showcase their skills. The innovative television broadcasts featuring comprehensive player profiles. As much as I hate to say it, I guess I'm fighting for respect in the poker world and winning an epic tournament would definitely give me more respect. And captivating storytelling brought the game to a broader audience and captivated viewers. For a brief period, it seemed that the Epic Poker League was on track to becoming a significant player in the poker industry. What made the league unique was that it was exclusionary, who met certain qualification criteria for multi-million dollar lifetime earnings, multiple wins, or cash at high level tournaments. We said, well, it should be some combination of um, having performed really well recently, because you have to be relevant today, but also consistency over time. And everyone was supposed to maintain adherence to a specifically defined code of conduct. This code of conduct was heavily enforced and the Epic Poker League voted to suspend the membership of Howard Lederer and deny membership to Chris Ferguson after the U.S. Justice Department filed a motion to amend a civil complaint, alleging that the two players were running a Ponzi scheme. Yes, Scott, there's a new amended complaint from the civil point of view from the Department of Justice today saying that Full Tilt Poker operated a Ponzi scheme through their Full Tilt Poker site. If you want to learn more about that, you can check out our video which goes into more detail. The link is in the description. Despite a promising start, the Epic Poker League's fall from grace was swift and dramatic. The primary factor that led to its demise was financial mismanagement. The league's business model heavily relied on securing substantial sponsorship deals and a lucrative television contract. Unfortunately, these anticipated revenue streams failed to materialize, leaving the EPL in a precarious financial position. The league faced challenges with low television ratings and struggled to attract a significant following, hampering its ability to generate sustainable revenue. These financial difficulties, combined with controversies surrounding the league's structure and governance, ultimately led to its downfall. In the face of mounting financial pressures, the Epic Poker League filed for bankruptcy in early 2012. The league's ambitious vision, once brimming with promise, came crashing down due to a combination of inadequate financial planning, unfulfilled revenue expectations, and a failure to resonate with a broader audience. The collapse of the EPL serves as a stark reminder of the importance of sound financial management, adaptability to market conditions, and a deep understanding of target audiences. Additionally, it highlights the challenges inherent in launching a new venture in a competitive industry even with experienced professionals at the helm. The rise and fall of the Epic Poker League is a cautionary tale that illustrates the precarious nature of venturing into uncharted territory within a well-established industry. Despite noble intentions and notable individuals like Annie Duke involved, the league ultimately succumbed to financial woes and a lack of widespread appeal. As the poker industry continues to evolve, it's crucial to learn from the mistakes of the Epic Poker League to foster future success and sustainability. Was there anything worse than this? The U.S. attorney in Manhattan says the site illegally paid $440 million to its director's money that the site allegedly took from customer accounts. Well, years before the infamous Full Tilt scandal, there was another controversy that rocked the poker world. The ultimate bet in Absolute Poker Super User Scandal was and still is considered one of the darkest chapters in poker history. But what really happened? We had a couple of questions for you, Mr. Hamilton. Are you in any way associated with the ultimatebet.net super user cheating scandal? Poker is a sport where fortunes are won and lost with the turn of a card, and where trust among players is paramount. The late 1990s and early 2000s marked the golden era of online poker, with websites like Ultimate Bet and Absolute Poker leading the charge. These platforms offered players from all corners of the globe the opportunity to test their skills and wits against opponents in real time without the constraints of physical locations. The lore of quick riches, anonymity, and the convenience of online play contributed to the poker boom. 
At the heart of the scandals were individuals who had initially contributed to the growth of online poker. Russ Hamilton was one such figure. Born in Detroit, Michigan in 1948, Hamilton had a modest upbringing and attended college at the University of Michigan before a conversation with a professor prompted him to drop out to pursue poker full time. His foray into the poker world began in Las Vegas, where he honed his skills and built a reputation as a formidable player. His early success and charisma, where he could bet 150,000 with top pair, or he could bet 150,000 with no pair, no nothing, or I mean anything. You just didn't know where he was at. <laughs> led him to become a beloved figure in the poker community. He would end up going on to win the 1994 World Series of Poker, where he won one million dollars. I can't tell you how happy we all are to see a Las Vegas hometown guy win it. Thank you. And you did a very good job. You didn't make any bad moves. And uh, you were a real gentleman about the whole thing. His rise to prominence in the poker world was marked by his success in both live and online poker. He was particularly renowned for his deep understanding of the game and his ability to read opponents. Hamilton's strategic acumen earned him respect among his peers, and he was widely admired for his contributions to the growth of the poker community. His involvement with Ultimate Bet and Absolute Poker began in a consulting capacity. His extensive knowledge of poker, coupled with his popularity, made him an attractive asset to these platforms. Little did he know at the time that his presence would eventually be synonymous with an incredibly dark period in the history of poker. The rise of Ultimate Bet and Absolute Poker was, in a word, meteoric. They offered players a wide range of games, generous bonuses, and the allure of competing against top-notch professionals. The sites also became platforms for aspiring players to realize their dreams, with some even turning online success into fruitful poker careers. These platforms hosted high-stakes games that attracted poker legends, including Phil Hellmuth, who Hamilton even recruited himself. And this created an exciting and a competitive atmosphere. The promise of huge cash prizes and the thrill of facing off against famous poker pros drew players in droves. The online poker community flourished with players sharing strategies, experiences, and building lasting friendships. However, the success story of Ultimate Bet and Absolute Poker was very short-lived. As the sites continued to grow, whispers of irregularities and suspicions of cheating began to circulate. Players reported anomalies in the gameplay such as suspiciously high win rates for certain individuals. The poker community's trust began to erode as players questioned the integrity of the platforms that they had once revered. The revelations that followed were shocking. It was discovered that certain individuals, including Russ Hamilton, had exploited vulnerabilities in the software to see their opponent's hole cards, a practice known as super user cheating. This enabled them to gain an unfair advantage, effectively rigging games in their favor. What I saw did not make any sense. Uh, when the other person was bluffing, he would always go all in. When the other person had some kind of made hand, he would always fold. A lot of this came to a head when an account called Pot Ripper won a 100,000 guaranteed $1,000 buy-in tournament in September 2007. After multiple hands of irregular play, the straw that would break the camel's back was the final hand of the tournament. Pot Ripper held a 10-9 offsuit in the small blind and limped in. The flop came up for King King and Pot Ripper bet 9,000 and was promptly called. The turn came a seven of spades and Pot Ripper bet 13,500 and was then check jammed all in for 200,310. In an insanely strange move, Pot Ripper called with just 10 high and no draw, winning the hand but ultimately garnering massive suspicion. This account was eventually traced back to the site's corporate offices in Costa Rica and was believed to have been the director of operations, AJ Green. On September 29th, 2008, the Gaming Commission stated it had found clear evidence that between the dates of May 2004 and January 2008, Russ Hamilton was the primary ringleader behind the scandal, cheating people out of money to the tune of approximately $20 million. In May 2013, recorded audio of discussions with Ultimate Bet Management were released, where Hamilton and other management can be heard discussing the scandal and their plans to cover it up. On the recording, Hamilton said things such as, And I, and I did take this money, and I'm not trying to make it right, Dan, so we've got to get that out of the way right, real quick, okay? Russ Hamilton has largely disappeared from the poker world and the public as a whole since. Very little is known about his current state, but suffice to say, there is nobody who feels bad for him or is looking to have him involved in the poker world ever again. He is currently the only World Series of Poker main event winner who doesn't have a banner hanging in the hallway or tournament area of the WSOP. At the end of the day, the fallout from the ultimate bet and absolute poker super user scandals was swift and it was brutal. The platforms faced lawsuits, regulatory scrutiny, and a tarnished reputation that they would never fully recover from. 
Players who had invested their time, their money, and their trust in these sites were left devastated and disillusioned. The poker community, which was once a tight-knit and trusting group, had been fractured by betrayal. And the repercussions extended beyond the online poker world, impacting the perception of poker as a whole. Trust among players and the integrity of the game became hot topics of discussion. The ultimate bet in absolute poker, super user scandals, remind us that trust is the bedrock upon which any community, whether online or offline, is built. The downfall of these once promising platforms illustrates the dire consequences of betrayal and the profound impact it can have on an entire community. As poker fans and as poker players, we must learn from these scandals, we must remain vigilant, uphold the values of integrity, and prioritize the trust that binds us together as a community. The wounds inflicted by the actions of a few may take time to heal, but they remind us of the importance of maintaining the purity of the game we love. I was the biggest game runner in the world. All tips. I still hadn't taken a rake, and I still hadn't accidentally recruited members of a Russian crime syndicate. This is Molly's Game, and outside of Rounders, it's one of the most prolific poker movies that's ever been produced. Written and directed by Aaron Sorkin and starring Jessica Chastain, the film follows Molly Bloom, a woman who ends up running the world's most exclusive high-stakes poker game during the height of the poker boom, eventually becoming a target for the FBI. But what's the real story behind the film, and who is the real Molly Bloom? And they sent this terrifying guy to my apartment and he put a gun in my mouth, which is something that you just never forget. In the glitzy world of high stakes poker, Molly Bloom's name looms large as a woman who defied stereotypes and became a central figure in the underground poker scene. Her journey from a promising athlete to the mastermind behind exclusive poker games frequented by Hollywood's elite is a captivating story that deserves some additional exploration. Born on April 21st, 1978 in Loveland, Colorado, Molly Bloom was raised in a family with a strong emphasis on education and on excellence. No! The second rule of his house is that academic excellence no, and athletic excellence weren't optional. Can't be afraid of it, all right? Don't play defense. She was a competitive skier with Olympic aspirations. However, an unfortunate accident derailed her skiing career, leading her to reassess her life's direction. Her academic achievements eventually earned her a spot at the University of Colorado, where she majored in political science. Molly's journey into the world of poker began innocently enough when she took a job as a bartender at the world-famous Viper Room after relocating to Los Angeles. The year was 2004. Darren Feinstein, one of the co-owners of the Viper Room nightclub, was approached by Spider-Man actor Tobey Maguire with a proposal to organize high-stakes poker games in the club's basement. Feinstein enlisted Bloom to oversee the players and manage the games. Her beauty, her charisma, and her intelligence quickly caught the attention of the players, and she soon transitioned into organizing and managing the games. Molly's ability to build relationships and maintain discretion made her indispensable to the high-stakes players, who included Hollywood A-listers, business tycoons, and even members of the Russian mob. In 2007, she established her own company, Molly Bloom Inc., specializing in event coordination and catering services, specifically for hosting poker tournaments. I'll be hosting a game in this suite every Tuesday night. If you play tonight, you'll be guaranteed a chair for a year. If you'd prefer to play at the Cobra Lounge, there'll be no hard feelings. Eventually, these poker games would evolve to take place in private residences and luxury hotels such as the Peninsula Beverly Hills, featuring stakes as high as $4 million. This exclusive poker scene attracted not only Toby Maguire, but also a notable roster of affluent individuals, celebrities, and sports figures. Among the regular attendees were Leonardo DiCaprio, Macaulay Culkin, Matt Damon, Ben Affleck, Alex Rodriguez, Nelly, Mary Kate and Ashley Olsen, and even Phil Ivey. The stakes were astronomical, with millions of dollars changing hands on any given night. Molly herself earned substantial sums in tips and a percentage of the pots, amassing a small fortune in the process. Her rise to prominence was nothing short of meteoric, and she became known as the Poker Princess. But despite her initial success, Molly's world began to unravel. The glitz and the glamour of the poker scene came at a steep cost. The constant presence of drugs and of alcohol, coupled with the enormous amounts of money involved, created a volatile environment. Molly found herself caught between the desires of her high-profile clientele and the temptations of her own success. Her loyalty to the players led her to make increasingly risky decisions, including taking a percentage of the pot and skirting around legal boundaries. And just as quickly, B calculated 2% of the pot and took it off the table. That was it. I just taken a rake in violation of U.S. Criminal Code 
1955. The 2008 recession led to a decline in underground poker games, prompting Molly to make a move in 2009. She settled into a high-rise apartment on the Upper West Side near Manhattan's Lincoln Center. It was here that she began hosting poker games in a private apartment at the newly established Astor Place and also in suites at the Plaza Hotel. These games were equipped with sophisticated dealing setups resembling those in casinos and were run by women recruited from the exclusive nightclub, One Oak. But Molly had limited contacts in New York and the underground poker scene was under scrutiny, leading to game relocations to Long Island. It was around this time that Molly started attracting wealthy Wall Street businessmen, but also less reputable gamblers whose wagers were notably smaller than those seen in Los Angeles. It was in 2011 when one of Molly Bloom's poker games in LA was forcibly closed due to a bankruptcy investigation related to a Ponzi scheme orchestrated by one of the players, Bradley Rutterman. Rutterman, who had participated in the game, had provided Bloom with money. Allegations arose that she had received $473,000 from Rutterman's bank to settle his debts, which caused her to be sued by the bankruptcy trustee. Then on April 16, 2013, everything came crashing down when Molly was arrested and charged, along with 33 others, as part of a $100 million operation involved in money laundering and illegal sports betting. Preet Bahara, the United States Attorney for the Southern District of New York, brought charges against 12 individuals for racketeering, while others were accused of money laundering, extortion, fraud, and running illegal poker rooms in New York City. At the time of her arrest, Molly was just 34 years old and faced a maximum penalty of 10 years in prison, along with six years of supervised release and a fine of $1.5 million. In May 2014, Molly decided to plead guilty to a lesser charge and received a sentence of one year probation, along with 200 hours of community service. You were charged in count 20 with operating an illegal gambling business in violation of Title 18, United States Code Sections 1955 and 2. During the sentencing, her lawyer explained that Bloom was in significant debt, which included forfeiting $125,000 in poker earnings as part of her plea deal. The assistant U.S. attorney acknowledged that substantial sums of money were wagered at these games, and that for a period, her games were likely the most significant in New York City. However, he also emphasized that compared to many others who were charged, the government believed that Bloom played a relatively minor role in the operation and recommended a sentence that did not involve jail time. The men and women who work there will commit more serious crimes by lunchtime today than the defendant has committed in this indictment. Today, Molly Bloom is married and living back in Colorado. She runs an initiative known as the Full Bloom, where she helps women get co-working spaces, as she is still just as passionate about networking. The lesson we can draw from Molly's story is one of ethical resilience. Success at any cost is not a sustainable path and compromising one's principles can have devastating consequences. Molly's journey reminds us that while ambition and determination are admirable, they must be tempered with a strong moral compass. Molly Bloom's life is a remarkable story of ambition, of glamour, and ultimately of redemption. From her early struggles as an almost Olympian, to her rapid rise in the poker world and subsequent fall, her journey showcases the allure and perils of the high-stakes world she inhabited. Her ability to reinvent herself and find redemption after hitting rock bottom offers hope and inspiration. Molly Bloom, the poker princess, defied convention and left her mark on poker forever. And that's it for this one. Thank you so much for checking out the episode. And if you like this one, please make sure to leave a like and let us know if you want more episodes like this in the future. Thanks for watching Poker Boom. We'll see you soon.